Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Victory in Jesus broadcast. My name is Jerry Hasty. It's always an honor and a pleasure to share the Word of God with you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to have a good word. We're going to believe that God is going to reveal some things to us, show some things to us that maybe we haven't seen before. And um, we're going to continue on our series, uh, Created to Rule and Reign. We did part one last week. We're going to do part two this week. The, the title of this message is Jesus Regains Dominion, Authority, and Power. What does that mean for us as believers? Amen. So, um, you know, the last time we were together, I talked to you about how uh, when God was in heaven, he decided that because he's a king, he decided that he wanted to expand his territory and create heaven on earth. He decided to create an earth and then create heaven on earth. In other words, his plan and his goal was to create a planet in which all the values and the culture of heaven would be transferred down to this new territory or this new colony called earth. He would have a viceroy in charge or viceroys in charge, and they would have dominion, authority, and power over all creation. They would then take that Garden of Eden that he planted and then begin to spread that across the entire earth. Amen. Uh, so we talked about that, and we talked about how uh, when those when that dominion came, there also came some rules and regulations that Adam had to follow. Really, there was only one. He had to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden. And we all know, if you've been in the Bible at all, that Adam fell. He actually committed high treason against heaven. And as a result, he handed over dominion, authority, and power to the enemy. Uh, Satan then has been the one who's had dominion in this world. He's, he's been in charge of all the world systems, and uh, he has the authority, the power, and the dominion that we were supposed to have uh, before the fall. But that's the bad news. The good news is, is that Jesus came, and when he came, he lived a sinless life, and ultimately redeemed man, and in the process of redeeming man, won back all the dominion, the authority, and the power that Adam lost in the garden when he sinned. In other words, he succeeded where Adam failed. Where Adam chose to sin and commit high treason, Jesus chose to live a life devoted to his father and uh, walk away from many temptations and ultimately uh, take our sin upon him and die in our place so that we could have eternal life and this restoration of dominion uh, and authority and power. Amen. But with that said, like I said, the title of this message tonight is Created to Rule and Reign, Part 2. Jesus regains dominion, authority, and power, what that means for us. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get right into this message. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that in your word, we find all these life-changing truths that if we take them into our heart and we mix them with faith, we will not only see changes in our lives, but changes for the better. We will see our lives uh, becoming more and more uh, like we would see in the kingdom of heaven uh, in a sinless world because we're renewing our mind to your word and we're, we're planting it in our heart. So, Father, tonight uh, we ask that you will give us guidance and direction, that you will open spiritual ears and spiritual eyes to see and hear uh, what you have for us tonight, that you will give me utterance, that you will speak through me the very oracles of God, that you will touch the hearts of those who are listening in a way they've never been touched before. So we honor you tonight, Father. You have said that you honor those who honor you. We give you praise and honor and, and glory. We, we thank you for who you are. We praise you for who you are. We bless you. We love you, Father. And we ask tonight that you will inhabit the praises of your people, that you will inhabit 
our and be with us in our presence. Be, be very present with us today. We know you're always with us. You live in us. But you said where there are two or three of you gathered in my, in my name, I am there as well. So, Father, we ask that you will reveal yourself in a very special way tonight, in a way that uh, will will really uh, cause the people that are hearing this to to sense your presence. And so, Father, we thank you ahead of time for speaking through me and helping me to speak the very oracles of God. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. All right, well, let's get started. Uh, Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will be reading from the English Standard Version the entire time, okay? And God is speaking here. This is right after Adam and Eve had sinned and uh, God had questioned Eve and then he, 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 he questioned Adam, then he questioned Eve, and then he questioned the serpent. And the serpent answered, and then uh, he, he basically said this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first promise to man and to Satan that there is going to be a redeemer, and that this lease that Satan has just gotten from Adam in earth is going to run out, okay? God is saying, you are going to be defeated. And and he's telling Satan that right from the start. And what does it mean? It says when he will bruise your head. A lot of versions say he's going to crush your head, okay? So basically, he's going to destroy Satan. And he said, well, what does it mean when he says, and he shall bruise his heel? Well, what that means is that Jesus was going to come and have to die for the sins of the world. The bruising of the heel is Jesus being crucified, dying on the cross for our sin. But then he was resurrected. And that sealed the fate of Satan. It bruised his head or crushed his head and ended his uh, possibility of being able to reign for eternity on this planet. Um. So we see that this is the first promise of redemption to man uh, for his high treason against heaven. And we see that uh, that it didn't take long for God to inform him that, yeah, you, you deceived man and you, you tricked man and you, you made him fall into sin, but you're going to pay the price for this. All right, turn with me to Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. I understand, too, that this death on the cross and resurrection by Jesus, it's not just the redeeming of man. He's getting back everything that man lost, all the dominion, the authority, and the power that man lost. It all is a package deal, okay? But here in Luke 4, 18, we see Jesus, he quotes the book of Isaiah here, and he applies it to himself. He says, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Now, a lot of people read this verse and they say, yeah, okay, so he has sent Jesus to proclaim good news, the gospel, the message of salvation to the poor, proclaim liberty to people that are captive and to uh, recovery of sight to those who are blind, that's healing, and, and set liberty those who are oppressed, who are oppressed by some oppressor. And people look at this simply in the natural. But there's a spiritual side to this too. You can look at this in a spiritual way. We were all poor. Uh, we're all lost. And, and we were poor. Okay? And the good news is that Our spirits were dead, and now they can be made alive by having faith in Christ Jesus. So we were all poor before we came to know Jesus as our Lord. And it says he proclaimed liberty to the captives. Well, when Adam transferred dominion, authority, and power over to Satan, we became captives. We became uh, captives to a 
dictator, uh, a king that was a, an ungodly, unruly, vicious king. And we were subject to him. It says, and it says here, it says, in recovery of sight to the blind. We were spiritually blind. You know, we were born into a, we, we started sinning and then we couldn't see our own sin after a while. We were spiritually blind. We could not see right from wrong. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. Again, Satan is an oppressor. He's an oppressor. Uh, Jesus came to set the captives free, it says. Okay? And so we were the captives. We were the ones who were oppressed. We were the ones who were blind. We were the ones who were poor. Spiritually, on all those levels. We were actually dead spiritually. Our spirit man was dead. We were alive physically, but we were dead spiritually. So we see Jesus is quoting this concerning himself. And, um, you know, by him regaining the kingship from Satan on this earth, that's how he could set us free. You see, when Adam sinned, he, before he sinned, he had the dominion, the authority, and the power to kick Satan out of the garden. He had the power to whip him. Satan was on his turf, on his territory, right? But when Adam messed up and he sinned, the kingship, the, the, the dominion, the authority and the power was passed to him. And then Adam, who was in control and had that dominion, was now subservient to this evil ruler, to this evil king. But when Jesus came, he won all that back. He was able to redeem man and win back that, that, that dominion, the authority, and power. The Bible says that he says, all power and authority has been given to me. So he regained it all, okay? So Jesus was the fulfillment of this prophecy in Isaiah. Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophecy in Genesis 3.15 that we read about. Because the crushing of the head was Jesus being resurrected from the dead. It sealed the fate of Satan. And the bruising of the heel was the crucifixion itself and Jesus having to die on the cross. So Jesus did what Adam didn't do. And I didn't say Adam couldn't do because Adam could have been obedient. Adam could have chose to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He had one job, and that was to say no to that tree. And he didn't. Like I said, he committed high trees, and he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat of the fruit. Direct rebellion, that was a direct command, direct rebellion, and with that, he lost everything. But Jesus came into a sinful world with, under the law, there was so many as 613 commands or something like that, more than one. And he came into an already sinful world and perfectly lived out the law so that he could be the perfect sacrifice, so that he could take our sin upon him and give us his righteousness. Amen. Give us his righteousness. So let's take a look at what Jesus did here a little deeper. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. Paul speaking here, he says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them unto open shame by triumphing them over them in him. So, see this. We were dead in trespasses and sin. And once you accept Jesus, you were dead in trespasses and sins. Then you are forgiven. And all those trespasses are washed away. 
But what I really want you to look at is verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So through the cross and his death on the cross, Jesus utterly destroyed Satan. He defeated him in every facet. I mean, to, 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 to basically put this in layman's terms, he embarrassed the powers of darkness in front of everyone, in front of heaven, and in front of themselves. In fact, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 2, 8, that if the powers of darkness, now I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing here, but Paul talks about how if the powers of darkness had known that they were going to seal their fate by crucifying Jesus, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. They would have never taken him out, okay? It just so happens that they didn't know that until they did it, amen? They didn't know that until they did it. So Jesus was able to live as a man and take, live a perfect life, sinless life, and take all all of man's sins on himself as a, as a sacrifice for him. In exchange, anybody that will accept Jesus as Lord will be able to get his righteousness, his right standing with God. Amen? Uh, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, for it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in a subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, you left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that the grace of God might, he might taste death for everyone. Man, this is packed, okay? So first of all, let's just say this. When man was created, okay, it wasn't angels that God put in charge of this planet. If you go back to Genesis, you see God gave man dominion, authority, and power, not angels. They weren't the ones that were supposed to have power and authority over this planet. Okay? It says uh, in verse 7, I think it's verse 7. Verse 7, let's talk about this. You made him for a little while a little lower than the angels. Now, again, we talked about this in the first message, that that in the Hebrew, and this is quoting directly from the book of Psalms, and in the Hebrew, that word a little lower than the angels, that word for angels is actually Elohim. It's actually Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is quoting here. And it says here, you made him a little lower than the angels. That's not correct. He made man a little lower than God. The Hebrew word for angels is Elohim. So he made us a little lower than God, a little lower than himself, okay? So when people say, you know, that angels are, are over us and, and angels are bigger and better than us and they're closer to God, that's incorrect. That's an incorrect statement. In an unfallen state or in a redeemed state, we have power and authority and dominion over angels. They're under us. They're not over us. Okay. Now, the fallen world, because they're in the kingdom of darkness and Satan is in charge of that realm, um, those people that are under him, including us at one time, you know, no, we are not over angels in that sense because he has authority over man unless you know Jesus, unless you've accepted Jesus as your Lord. Um, but that, that, that verse, those verses are incorrectly translated a little lower than angels when it should be a little lower than God himself, okay? 
It says, now I'm putting everything in subjection to him. He left nothing outside of his control. See, this whole planet was under Adam's control. But when Adam messed up, when Adam committed high treason, when Adam fell, we don't currently see that. I mean, we should see it through the church and individual church members, but even the church is not operating in the authority that they should be operating in right now. Okay, it says, but we see in verse 9, it says, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So we see again that Jesus tasted death for everyone. Jesus now has all that power and authority and dominion that Adam lost. Okay. And we see that he was able to redeem all of mankind if they will accept him as their Lord. Um, so again, Jesus succeeded where Adam failed. And again, I'm going to say this again because I want people to understand. You hear people say, you know, um, Adam, you know, he couldn't avoid eating the tree or whatever. That's not true. He had a will. He, he had the command and the will, and he chose to sin in a sinless world. And Jesus had the same option. He had the same opportunity, yet he did not. So it isn't that Adam couldn't do it. What he couldn't do, he didn't do it, and Jesus did, okay? So let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought, about why Jesus had to come as a man. I mean, he's God, right? And he's the ultimate king. He's the king of kings. It, when Adam was in charge as king, he could have stripped power away from Adam. Okay? How come he doesn't just strip the power away from Satan? How come he doesn't take it away? Because there are legalities in all of this. See, uh, God doesn't break his word. His word is his word. And so when he handed power over to Adam, even though Adam went and handed it over to the enemy, Satan, the only way God could rightfully get it back and give it back to man is to become a man and win it back from Satan as a man. Once he did that, then he could return that dominion, authority, and a power back over to man, okay? But Jesus did lawfully what Adam didn't do in the very beginning. Um, so what does all this mean for us? Turn with me to Romans chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Romans chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Paul is speaking here. Now listen to this. Therefore, as one trespass, trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Okay, so we, we are byproducts of Adam. Every human being can trace back their lineage all the way to Adam and Eve. They are the first parents of the human race. And because of their fall, because of their sin, they originally had a human nature, but when they sinned, they took on a sinful nature. Okay? And that's why it says here, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Why was that? Because once Adam fell, he had a sinful nature that he passed down to every human being that would ever live. He passed that seed of sin down to every human being that would ever live. See, I, I, I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. When you were born, you were considered a sinner, not because you had even sinned yet, but because you had a sin nature and given enough time, you would sin. You would eventually sin. 
But it says that just as one man's in disobedience, the many were made sinners, by the one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. What does that mean? What does the word righteous mean? What the word righteous means is right standing with God. Or uh, it's, you know, a lot of people think it's right behavior, and it can be, but the definition here is right standing with God. When man sinned, he fell out of right standing with God. And when, when, when Adam, I mean, when, when Jesus uh, died on that cross and was resurrected from the dead and raised up to heaven, and we were given that opportunity to receive what he did and accept him as Lord, then we, we, he took our sin and he gives us his righteousness. It's called the great transfer. He took our sin, a sinless human being, and gave us his righteousness. We were sinners, okay? So he just switched it up. When we accept Jesus, he gives us his righteousness, his right standing, which means we have everything he has. We have the power, we have the authority and the dominion because he has all of that, because he won all of that back, okay? So by faith in Jesus, you would have, you have exactly what uh, he has, which is that power, dominion, and authority. Now, that doesn't mean that you're never going to sin again. Just because uh, you get born again, and you're saved, and uh, you have his righteousness, that doesn't mean that you're never going to sin again. I've said this before, and we're, we're going to go over it again really quick right here. You are a spirit being. You have a soul, and you live in a body. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, your thinker, your chooser, your feeler. But your spirit man was what died in the garden. Your spirit man, in other words, you're really born dead. You're born spiritually dead, okay, because of Adam. He died spiritually in the garden. He didn't die physically right away. He, he, his soul was still there. He still had a mind and a will and emotions, but spiritually he died. He still had a spirit, but it was, he was spiritually dead to God, okay? And that's what he passed on to every successive generation is spiritual. Your spirit man is dead. You're spiritually disconnected from God, okay? And so... What happens is when you get born again, you get a brand new spirit. And Ephesians, I think it's 1, chapter, thir chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, I'm not sure. But it talks about how you've been sealed, okay, vacuum-packed, sealed by the Spirit of God, which means God's Spirit comes and lives with your spirit, and ultimately you are vacuum pack sealed in your spirit your spirit cannot be defiled by sin even if you sin because it's god made sure that it was sheltered off sectioned off from the rest of you so why do you sin after you get born again because you still have a soul you still have a mind and a will and emotion that has been um, contaminated by this world from childhood you've been taught the wrong things you've thought the wrong things you thought in line with the kingdom of darkness because that's, you have a sinful nature. You had a sinful nature. You thought in line with the kingdom of darkness. So ultimately, the only way to change that is to get into the Bible, into the word of God, and start changing the way you think to line up with what the Bible says the way you should think, okay? So you still have um, an unrenewed, soul an unrenewed mind and over time you can you can renew your mind to god's word and you can see yourself improving but it's not that you're improving in your soul or your flesh what's happening is you're lining up your soul with what's already in your spirit man what is in the word of god okay and you still have a flesh you still have a body that 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 desires sin and so you're always going to be tempted with something. And yes, you can get past that temptation by planting the word of God in your heart and overcoming those desires. But you're always going to be battling something because you had a fallen nature. And it's like, it's like getting a new hardware 
system, but keeping the old software on it. Okay, you're still going to have the same result. But if you get a new hardware system and you put new software on it that's greater and more improved, then you're going to see a big difference. But if you put old software on new hardware, you're going to see the same thing. You may see a little bit of improvement here and there, but you're going to see the same thing. Okay. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus is here. Let's listen to what he has to say. And Jesus came and said to them, he's talking about his disciples, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. This is after the crucifixion. Go therefore and make disciples of nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So how did Jesus get all authority in heaven and earth? Well, when he got crucified on that cross, went into the grave, when he got resurrected, it was done. He had won back all that dominion, authority, and power. And here we see it. And he's passing on that power, that dominion, that authority to disciples, to guys that are not even born again. At this stage, they weren't born again. Okay? They didn't have the Holy Spirit living in them yet. This is just him telling them to go out and, and spread the good news. But they're not born again yet, and they don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How much more does this apply to us since we are born again and have the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Amen? So what is this victory that Jesus gained for the believer, what does it mean for us as believers? Because um, clearly we now have this power and authority. But let's take a look at that. Uh, turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Paul is speaking here, and he's talking about Jesus and what he did for us. Paul says, he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Everything in this verse is past tense. Notice that? He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness. He's transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. He's redeemed us. And he's forgiven us of our sins. All of this is past tense. All of this is in the past. We're not waiting for heaven for all this to happen. We're really not. It's already happened. We just need to recognize that and believe that and mix it with faith and and match what's what we already know in our spirit, man. Amen? So where is the dominion of darkness right now? You know, a lot of people tell you, well, Satan's in hell and the angels are, his demons are in hell. Well, if that was so, how can people be demon-possessed? If that was so, how can he do anything to us up here on the earth if he's in hell? Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, he is not in hell. He's not on fire right now. He ain't, his demonic forces are not on fire right now. They are right here on this planet. And they are influencing world systems. This is the system here on earth. It's called a Babylonian system. Because it's, it's, Satan is considered the god of this world. That means he's the god of the worldly systems. He is in, he's in charge of the banking systems. He's, he's controlling banking systems. And he's controlling... Uh, all sorts of other systems on the planet. He's controlling leaders that are not submitted to him. And he's making them do his bidding. So he, he is, he is, he's in charge of the world system. He's the God of the world system. Okay. So the dominion of darkness is right here, right now on this planet. Okay. That's what we've been delivered from. 
the dominion of darkness here, Satan's kingdom. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. Let's, let's, let's look at this, man. This is amazing. Paul speaking again here says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love of which he has for us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now look at that last verse, verse 6. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places. So if you notice, God took us and transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son or into the kingdom of light or into the kingdom of heaven, okay? Then he seats us in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, which means we're seated right there with him in our spirit man in heavenly places, amen? Listen, being seated with him is not just that you're seated in a location. That seating is a position. Whatever position he has in heavenly places, you also have that position in heavenly places because you're in him. You, you have a position now of dominion and authority and power over the enemy. Amen? Okay, turn with me to Ephesians. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. 22 and 23. Here Paul is speaking again. And he says, and he put all things under his feet. That's the Father putting all things under Jesus' feet. And gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Okay, so let's look at this again. He delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son. He seated us with his son in heavenly places. And now, if we're with his son in heavenly places, okay, and we're in him and all things are under his feet, then guess what that means? that all things are under your feet, including Satan. See, if you're seated with Jesus in heavenly places, other places in the Bible say we are in Christ, okay? So you could take any area of the scriptures to talk about us being in Christ. And if we're in Christ, then it only makes sense that if everything is under his feet, then everything is under our feet as well, Okay? Everything is under our feet as well. Which means me, we, have a power, we have a position of power and dominion and authority over the demonic forces on this planet. Amen? Turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Paul speaking again here. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So check out what this verse is saying. We are co-heirs. <laughs> heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. You know, an heir is entitled to everything that, God has, or in this case, everything that God has, we are co-heirs with Christ. So everything he has, we have. He's seated in heavenly places, we're seated in heavenly places. All things are under his feet, all things are under our feet, okay? So that means this includes dominion, authority, and power, amen? Because you are a joint heir with Christ. That's what some versions say. Turn with me to Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Jesus is speaking here, and he says this, Fear not, little flock, 
for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You see, God's plan never was changed after Adam's fall. God's plan was that man (laughs) would have the kingdom from the beginning. That the kingdom of God would be in them and that they would rule under that kingdom as viceroys over the earth. They would be the kings of this colony, the kings of this territory, and they would exercise dominion, authority, and power on this territory, spreading the values and the culture of heaven. You know, the the Bible talks about, in in the Lord's Prayer, it says, um, you know, uh, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. His desire has always been to bring heaven to earth. And his desire never changed. Even after Adam fell, his desire for that never changed. He always wanted to bring heaven to earth. And that's why he sent Jesus to restore the kingdom. Yes, we were redeemed, but God is sovereign. And I know people misuse that. God is ultimately going to have his ultimate will with what he wants on this planet. And he wants a planet that will be led by people that are going to spread kingdom, values, and cultures through the entire planet. And and he was going to have that happen one way or another. Whether Adam fell or didn't fall, he was still going to have it. So his plan for man never changed, even after Adam fell. Um, turn with me to back a little bit to Luke chapter 10, verse 19. What does this all mean for us as believers? What does this mean for us? Now listen very carefully. This is Jesus. He says, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Now, again, this was talking to the 72 that he sent out to preach the good news and to to heal the sick and raise the dead, right? This was talking to them. But like I said before, these guys weren't born again. They weren't born again. No one got born again until Jesus was resurrected from the dead, okay? No one received the Holy Spirit until Jesus ascended to heaven and the Spirit of God was sent down. So this, no one received the baptism of the Holy Spirit until they got born again, okay? So what I'm trying to say here is that if these are old covenant guys, they're really under the old covenant still. And Jesus is saying, here, you have this power, authority, and dominion. What does that mean for us? As born again believers, with the Spirit of God living inside of us, some of us are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And we should be operating in a greater level here. Okay, that's what that means for us, that God's asking us to step up our game, to begin to know who we are and what we have in Christ and take this dominion, authority, and power and start using it to influence the world around you. Start using it uh, to to change uh, and frame your world and the world around you, and influence this culture, this demonic culture, uh, with the values and the culture of heaven right now. Because that's what's going to get people saved. When they start hearing the kingdom, and they start hearing about what God's done for them, then when they hear that message in power and authority, that's what gets people saved. Okay, That's what gets them to hear God through you, and receive Jesus as their Lord. Amen? Um, But if these guys uh, were able to operate in this kind of authority, uh, you too should be able to operate in like what it says in Mark 16, verses 17 and 18, you know, healing the sick, raising the dead. Let me tell you something. You do something like that, you're going to get people's attention. Not just the person that gets healed or raised from the dead, but all the people around are going to see that And they're going to be like, whoa, there's something else going on here. It's not just words. You know, Paul talks about how uh, the kingdom of God is not about 
talk, it's about power, okay? And so, yes, there is some words, you gotta preach the kingdom, but there also has to be a demonstration of that, okay? Um, Jesus talks about how, you know, these signs will follow you when you preach the gospel. That proves to people that what you're preaching is right. You're saying you're doing this in the name of God and it's happening. And that's the evidence that you are actually preaching what God told you to preach, okay? But I wanna close for tonight, but I wanna give you an opportunity to accept Jesus as your Lord. Listen, you, you can't even begin to even think about operating in dominion, authority, and power on this planet the way Jesus wants you to if you've never received Jesus as your Lord. If you don't believe that he took your sins and died for your sins, took them upon himself, and he's now been able to, he can, he'll give you his righteousness if you receive him as Lord. If you haven't done that and you don't believe that, then you'll never operate in this. You can't just open the Bible and start operating in this. You have to have God living in you. You have to receive Jesus as your Lord. You have, and by accepting him as Lord, that means you're saying you're commander in chief of my life. I'm giving my life to you. Anything I knowingly, anything I willfully do wrong, I know is wrong. And, and, it, and, and I shouldn't willfully do anything wrong. You know, now I may make a mistake here and there, but we need to be quick to repent and we need to get back on track. That's what it means to accept him as Lord. He knows you're not going to be perfect, but he wants to know that your heart is perfect with him, that your heart is right, that you are saying, I'm surrendering my life to you, okay? So now being in the dominion of darkness, sure, Satan, who he'll take some of the power and authority he has and he'll give it to people. He'll give it to world leaders. He'll give it to, you know, singers and songwriters and movie stars and TV actors and actresses and sports athletes. And he'll give it to them because he can use them to spread his kingdom on the earth. So they'll get, they can get a degree of authority and power, but they don't have dominion. Satan's not going to give up his dominion. He'll let you operate in power and authority in concurrence with what he wants. But he's not going to give you dominion, right? God's done that. He's given, given you back the dominion, the authority, and power if you accept Jesus as your Lord. So tonight, I want to give you the opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord. If you, you know, say this prayer, I'm going to give you a chance to pray with me. If you say the prayer from your heart, you are going to get born again. And when you get born again, everything's going to change. You're going to be able to get into the Bible. God's going to start speaking to you through his word. And you're going to be able to hear from his spirit. And if you apply those things that you're reading in the word by faith to your life, you're going to hear from him more and more. It's progressive. Okay? But if you'll pray this prayer with me, you'll get born again. And if you mean it from your heart. Okay? And then after that, We'll, we'll talk about some other things, okay? But bow your head and pray with me if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord. Say, Father, I'm a sinner. I've fallen short of your perfect standard. I need a Savior. I've messed up my life. I need a Lord. I need someone to tell me how to live my life, what I need to do, how I need to do it. I need guidance. And so, Father, I believe that you sent Jesus to die for my sins, to take all of my sins on him, on his sinless body at the cross, and die for me, so that if I receive him as my Lord, I will be saved. I will have eternal life with you forever. I accept Jesus now as my Lord, my commander-in-chief. And if I've committed any sin that I can think of, I repent of that sin 
I repent of anything I know is wrong. And I ask for your forgiveness, Father. And I ask that you will now fill me with your spirit, empower me with your spirit, and change my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer, you just got born again. Now, it's important for you to get into a good Bible-believing church because Christianity is not a lone ranger type of thing. Uh, I actually tried doing that. I tried just studying the Bible, not going to church. When I first came to the Lord, I was hungry for the Word of God. And I was studying and reading the Word. And, and I mean, I was like, my heart was burning within me. It was so enjoyable and so fun. And I was just loving God so much. But I didn't understand everything I read. And when I would read it, the enemy, I didn't know it was the enemy at the time, but the enemy would be like, well, see, you're, you're doing that. You're a sinner. Your righteousness is like filthy rags. And he would talk to me and say things. And I didn't know Satan was talking to me, but I would hear things in my head. You know, you sinned again. How can God keep forgiving you? And see, that's why I say, when you're a new believer, you don't recognize these things. You don't recognize the enemy is talking to you. Okay? So what I want you to understand is that's why you need good fellowship with good, solid, seasoned believers. See, because if you came to me and said, I just feel like Satan keeps, you know, I keep feeling like God will never forgive me. I fell again. I made him another mistake. I can tell you the enemy is condemning you. Your conscience is condemning you. Okay? So you need to repent and let it go. You know, Satan will make you question your salvation. And I mean, here I was on fire for the Lord, loving so many things I was reading, not understanding everything. But at the same time, the enemy was speaking to me, telling me I wasn't good enough and I needed to do something, all sorts of lies. And eventually I fell away because I was trying to be a Lone Ranger Christian. And eventually I came back, back into the, back into the fellowship with the Lord. And I found a good Bible believing church and here we are today, thank goodness. I didn't, uh, I didn't fall away forever. But that's why it's important for you to get into a good Bible-believing church so that you can grow and have someone fellowship with other believers that are like-minded and, and have someone, a pastor speaking into your life to help you to, to learn and grow what the Word of God means in certain areas so you won't be all alone in your quest. Amen. So this is the thing. If you don't have a good church, I, I'm here in the Orlando area. And if you live in the Orlando area and you're hearing this and you want to come to our church, the church that I attend, um, you know, just drop me a message in, in the comment section below and let me know a way to get a hold of you. And I will, I'll touch base with you and let you know how we, we get together and so forth and so forth. If you have just said that prayer and you live some other place, like if you live outside of the United States or anywhere, you live in, you know, the Ukraine or Russia or Australia or Japan or wherever you live, I know uh, some people that know of really good pastors in pretty much every region of the country and every region of the world. So, if you live somewhere else and you don't have a place to go to church, message me, email me, uh, let me know uh, that you want to find a good Bible-believing church. Just send me uh, like your email in the comment section or something, and uh, I, I will touch base with you. I'll help you, okay? Um, if you like this message, please uh, put a like on it, share, comment. Make a nice comment, and because it helps the algorithms. I, I learned that you know the other day that it's so important for people to like, share, and comment because it, it changes the way YouTube uh, looks at the video. Amen. So with that said, we're all done for tonight. Um, just remember, God loves you. I love you, and we'll see you next time.